Thank you. Also, there is a, I have a handout in your folder as well. I cherry picked the best slides that I thought were the most important from both talks today. So there's that too. All right, so as you can see here, this picture, this is in Adams County. Uh, this is, I see this every day to and from work. Uh, supposedly a drain tile collapsed. I don't know if that, that's accurate or not, but it's looked like that since late September. So we definitely have super saturated conditions in Adams County. And on my drive here, I saw you guys, you're pretty super saturated as well as I saw all the standing water in the sides of the roads and in the wetlands too. It could be worse. <laughs> perspective. I always like offering perspective. This was taken in 1941. This was a Valencia orchard. A dam had overflowed or broke and flooded this orchard. So that year they had a harvest by boat and by bathing suit. So, I, you know, it could be worse, folks. Uh, I want to start by talking about the vulnerabilities of the tree fruit, the different fruit trees and also the root stocks. The reason why is after a year like last one, it's a good idea to keep a close eye on those most vulnerable fruit trees. The most tolerant trees to water log conditions are quince, followed by pear, then apple, citrus, plums, and prunes. Japanese plum is quite sensitive, and then apricots, cherries, and peaches are the most sensitive to waterlogged conditions. And I can attest for this, being apricot being the most sensitive. I planted apricots in 2016 or 2017, and um, yeah, they're dropping like flies to soil-borne diseases last year. So uh, obviously I picked the wrong site to plant. As far as, hmm. All right, Ugh. we have a, uh, okay, so let's try this again. Okay, there we go. Uh, as far as rootstocks go, Betchafolia is the most tolerant. This is the common rootstock for Asian pear. For very tolerant, we have our apple rootstocks, B9, 118, M9. I have some of the Geneva rootstocks there. This hasn't been 100% confirmed. This is all anecdotal, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but what I've heard anecdotally from the nurseries and from those who have grown on these Geneva series, they've been pleasantly surprised and happy with them. Stockton Morello is a cherry root stock. This doesn't seem to be used as much as anymore. On the moderately tolerant, we have the pear root stock OHF97, M7, G16, which there should be a question mark because this is another Geneva root stock. Mazard is a cherry root stock. Under sensitive, we have M26, 106, 111s, and Mahalib. Yesterday, um, I heard the Penn State horticulturist talk, and he actually said Mazard and Mahalib were sensitive um, to waterlogged conditions. And then all of the peach root stocks are sensitive. So if you have your peaches in a low lying area that's not well drained, or really you saw a lot of waterlogged nests last year, you want to keep an eye on them this year. So as far as what we're going to talk about today in relation to water log conditions and soilborne diseases, well, I, I should have modified my title. It should have been more of like what's going to happen with regards to trees and the, on the disease front when you have too much water in the soil. So there are direct issues and indirect issues. And the direct issues, there are the soilborne diseases. We have a new one for Pennsylvania. Not sure if this has been found in Apple in Maryland, but the further south you go, it seems to be more common. It's called Southern Blight. You may be familiar with Southern Blight on soybean or um, sorghum or tomatoes or potatoes. It's the similar pathogen, causes the same symptoms. Fusarium rot and Phytophthora crown and root rot, both of these are soil-borne pathogens. They cause similar symptoms. Uh, they're both bad. They both can kill trees. As far as indirect, it's more of the stress that the waterlogged conditions can create. Uh, Cytospora leucostoma canker, also known as perennial canker. Keep an eye on those peach trees next year for this. This is, I'm, I'm worried about an outbreak with regards to this popping up on peach trees. Uh, rapid apple decline. This is an issue we've seen in Pennsylvania and really throughout the Northeast about young apple trees succumbing to a mysterious issue. A lot of them in a short period of time. And it seems to be coinciding with an, a stressor, some kind of unforeseen stressor. After a year like last year, we may see, we may be observing apple trees kind of biting the dust on not, and not sure why. 
And then finally, we'll talk about mitigation strategies. So as far as what are common symptoms when you see root rot issues or, or wood issues, if, it's hard to tell, but these leaves are purple. And if you see even chlorotic leaves or purplish leaves, has nothing to do with the aerial part of the tree. All the action and all the issues are either in the soil or at the crown. So that's where you want to investigate when you see above ground symptoms like that. So what you'd want to do is kind of pull the weeds back, scrape off the bark, and look at the trunk of the tree and the graft union. In this case, there's lots of necrotic tissue there, a lot of dead tissue. Um, this can be caused by graft, um, the graft union death can be caused by a virus like tomato ring spot virus. This is transmitted by a nematode. It can be caused by a fungal disease like white rot or black rot. These are fungi that take advantage of a stressed out situation, a tree that's stressed out. They will not attack healthy trees. Uh, and also bacterial, it could be a bacterial influence. Fire blight can cause rootstock blight and you would see similar symptoms like this. Graft union's dead, you have girdling the lower part of the tree, the tree's going to die. Now if you see rootstock suckers, the roots are healthy. That tells you the roots, there's nothing going on with the roots because the tree is trying to you know, survive by pushing up rootstock suckers. So that's a signal to you that, hmm, this may not be a soil-borne issue as far as my tree dying. As far as if it is a soil-borne issue, you'd want to pull up the tree, scrape back the bark, and if you see at the crown here, like brownish, reddish, necrotic area, the roots are necrotic, pull back the mud, and if there is mud there, mud and dirt, uh, look at the roots. There may be a musty smell. This is a very typical, these are very typical symptoms of a root rot pathogen or a crown rot pathogen. Now, as far as the first, this first disease goes, um, southern blight. So I, I observed this in Adams County in August. I had a grower contact me. He said he had 2018 crimson crisp trees on bud nine. Come and look at them. They're dropping like flies. And then I went over and looked at them. And I noticed in the process that I had some trees affected. So I had all various years, trees that were planted in 2018, 16, 2007, 2011, on various rootstocks all succumbing to this issue. And it didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason as far as pattern, location, what the previous crop was. So upon investigation, what I did was I pulled up the tree guards and what I found was this white mycelia mat that was at the base of the tree or the crown of the tree. Also, there, there, there were these tiny little round balls. That's called sclerotia. That's the fruiting body of the fungal pathogen. When I dug up the tree, I saw all this white mycelia, all these white threads through the soil. And they had these little globular structures on them. And I believe that's the early part of the sclerotia. Sometimes the sclerotia were right on the mycelia on the graft union or on the trunk. When I scrape back more of the, the bark tissue and the rootstock, the rootstock was dead. So this is a pathogen in the soil attacking the root and killing the root and killing the rootstock. And no, the tree guards had nothing to do with it. Um, I had someone ask me that because it all started in the soil. So the question is, could this be an issue for tree fruit growers next year? In here, since we're a little further south, has anyone ever encountered this really on any crop? Have you ever seen this before? You basically see sclerotia and Rossi, soybeans. Yes. You see southern blight of tomatoes on a number of Okay, so crops. it's here. I, I see you've got a different name. Yes. The last thing. Oh. So we're familiar with the sclerotia and Rolf, Rolf Yeah, variety. so this, is the, this was sclerotium rolfsii variety delphinii. And they, it's different enough where it's its own species now. But essentially, the symptoms are the that, same. That would carry over on soybeans and tomatoes and... Good question. I'm not sure if it will or not. It's on hostas. It's definitely on hostas. That, that's where we see it. Yeah. And it, it, it's... It, yeah. And so basically, it's very similar. And I think down south, I think, you know, with research and techniques, they've split out the species. But it's in the same group of, of fungi. So as far as what caused it, well, it can survive in the soil a long time. It likes really warm soil and warm temperatures, and it likes really super saturated soil. So we pretty much set ourselves up. In Pennsylvania so far, it seems to be in the most south central part of the state where we've seen it, which makes sense. Um, 
you know, as far as not being in more northern areas because it seems to be more sporadic up there. Youngest trees are most susceptible, but in this case, I, any tree really is it can be affected. So this is what the orchard looked like. You can see dead trees. So the question is, is it salvageable? And yes, I believe it is salvageable. The first thing, should you ever encounter this, what you want to do is dig up the tree and bag it. Put it in a bag, dig up a couple scoopfuls of the soil to get any of that sclerotia, put it in a bag, and you want to carry it out of the orchard because you don't want to spread that sclerotia around or any of the fungal parts of, of the pathogen. Uh, so you can soil solarization, put down black plastic over that, oh, those affected areas. The soil solarization is going to cook the soil, hopefully. Um, as far as, as how well this works, not 100% sure, but this is what's in the literature. So it's, it's better than nothing because our chemical control measures are few and far between. Uh, there is a product out there called Omega. It, the active ingredient is called fluazinam, and this is labeled for southern blight on carrot, believe it or not. It's also labeled for apples above ground, but not for soil drenching. So I'm trying to work with the company with Syngenta to try to get an additional use permit as a just in case, since this seems to be the only really effective chemical out there once you have the issue. As far as prevention goes, if you encounter southern blight, you're going to want to be following the same, the same strategies as far as crop rotation goes. Uh, you know, try, if you're planting in a site, uh, apples in a site that may have seen tomatoes or potatoes or soybeans or clover or another crop where southern blight's an issue, you may want to be wary. Corn is not a host. So rotating in after corn is actually a good thing because since it's not a host, the population of the pathogen is going to decrease. As a non-host, the pathogen can't really survive, so its numbers are going to drop. So corn would be a good crop to rotate in after, um, after you've had an issue, and then put corn in and then put apples in. And then the other thing as far as doing sanitation, make sure the area around the tree is clean of dead debris, although in a lot of these cases, the, the area was clean. So the organic debris really, you know, there wasn't any organic debris there. It was all within the soil. So as far as other soil-borne pathogens, so you saw this picture before. So this uh, was fusarium root rot and fusarium and also Phytophthora like standing water. And fusarium has another caveat. Fusarium likes soil with like very low oxygen. So imagine flooded soils, very little O2 in there. Fusarium will most likely flare up if it's there. And I think that's what happened in this situation with this one grower's orchard. The soil was like cement mix. It was that soupy. It was, I've never seen anything like it. But this was definitely fusarium rot. But you, for management, it has to be preventative. When the conditions are present, that's when you need to treat. So if, you, if there is a risk for Phytophthora, Ritamil, Prophyte, Rampart, Aliette, these phosphorus acid-based products, all these products work against Phytophthora, but it has to be there before you see symptoms. Once you see symptoms, it's too late. In the case of Fusarium, it's just Rampart that I've found so far. Fusarium's on the Rampart label. This is another phosphorus acid-based products. If you've had an issue, what to do in the future? Fumigation. And there's a couple different ways you could fumigate. Okay, as far as the indirect issue goes, so Cytospora canker, Leucostoma canker, perennial canker, not a soil-borne issue, but can erupt after a year we've had like this when we've had a really stressed out situation when we've had such super waterlogged soils. Affects both palm and stone fruit, but stone fruit are most susceptible. And what the symptoms are, you would see a canker or branch dieback, kind of hard to see, gamosis, but, but don't get fooled. Gamosis can happen for a lot of reasons. It wouldn't just be for leucostoma. There's a lot of other things that cause gamosis. But gamosis is often, it's, it's connected with a, having a canker. Um, also, an elliptical canker. This is a very characteristic symptom also of cytospora canker, perennial canker. Uh, as far as how it wreaks havoc, well, the fungus doesn't attack growing trees. Once the trees come out of dormancy, the immune system's turned on, the fungus it has a hard time attacking the tree. It only attacks the tree during dormancy, and this occurs from February until April, and it seems to survive in all temperatures. 
And as far as it grows in the bark, so whenever the temperature's above freezing, it'll stop in the spring when the tree starts growing. It likes wetness, especially when the canker gets wet, it spews more spores. High humidity, this is gonna increase disease incidence in your orchard. Consequently, it's best to delay pruning really once the tree wakes up as late as possible in the season. This will help you manage this disease a bit better should it be showing up. So that's gonna greatly reduce the risk. Why? Because you're going to have the lowest spore availability at that time of the year, from March and through May. So as far as uh, other management strategies, nutrient management is going to be a must, especially after a year like this one where there may have been lots of leaching in the soil because of the high amounts of water that we had. So you definitely want to be doing soil tests and leaf tests in order to determine that your nutrients are good. Providing a balanced nitrogen um, in the soil. And you want to avoid anything that's going to delay dormancy. So be mindful when you apply your nitrogen. Potassium, making sure you have adequate potassium. Potassium seems to be the, as far as the really key nutrient for managing this disease, and it provides resistance. This work has come out of Colorado. Controlling bores, make sure anything that would create a wound, bores or OFM, um, oriental fruit moth. There's more information in our tree fruit production guide, if you have it. Another way to find this information, and it also talks about this type of surgery to cut out the canker. If you just search Penn State Extension Cytospora peach, it will, that will be like the first thing that comes up on the search. Um, but there's a lot of information out there about Cytospora canker. Okay, so rapid apple decline. So if you see a bunch of your trees declining, first we need to rule out soil-borne pathogens, if we rule out soil-borne pathogens and there's rootstock suckers showing up, then we'll talk about rapid apple decline. Should you encounter something like this next or this coming season where your trees are declining, they're pushing up a lot of rootstocks, we've eliminated soil-borne pathogens, contact me. Um, this, the, we, there is, well, we don't know what's going on with rapid apple decline. It's a bit of a mystery. It's still a black box at this point. But it seems the trees um, don't like stress. It seems they seem to be most susceptible um, that trees have been, have been under stress. Okay, as far as control measures, well, if you aren't planting this year and you're planting the future, fumigation. Fumigation, there's lots of general biocides. This is going to kill everything in the soil. All the good guys, the bad guys, weeds, nematodes. You need a licensed fumigator to do this. Um, you'll be tarping the soil to gas it out. You then remove the tarp to allow it to volatilize, and then you have to wait a period of time before you can uh, plant your trees. Because remember, it's a general biocide, and so you don't want to gas out your trees if you plant them too soon. Another way of fumigation is biofumigation through a cover crop. And there are lots of options. You've got mustard, Sudan grass, rapeseed. And for planting, Sudan, um, mustards and Sudan grass has to be drilled at a certain rate. Uh, in the case of Sudan grass, it's 30 to 50 pounds per acre. Mustards and rapeseed, it's 8 to 10 pounds per acre. Growing conditions. The growing conditions may be your deciding factor of what you use early in the season. For mustards, they need a lot of moisture, so it's best to sow them, plant them, either in the spring or mid-August. It needs 120 units the acre of nitrogen and also 20 units the acre of sulfur. This is important. Uh, you just can't plant it and walk away. You have to make sure that you provide the right conditions for the planting. Sudan grass, the nitrogen units or nitrogen requirements are similar, but Sudan grass does better in warmer, drier conditions. Um, so if there's a risk of not getting enough moisture, Sudan grass may be your option. So you plant you Sudan grass um, and early in the season, in the fall, you would do rapeseed. It's recommended to do, do plantings, two plantings, when you're doing a cover crops for biofumigation. Now, biofumigation using cover crops, the more cover crop you use, the more bioactive compounds you have. And how do you get the bioactive compounds? You chop it up, and then you incorporate it in immediately. When you chop it up, you can lose about 80% of, of those volatiles that are being released when it's being chopped up. So you need to be incorporating it immediately. And after you incorporate it, you would then irrigate or cultipack it to trap it in. 
So this is another option with regards to dealing with, so this will help with nematodes and will also help with plant pathogens as well, other uh, soil-borne pathogens. Okay, so as far as what else to do for future plantings, considering your rootstocks, rootstocks that are a little bit more durable. Uh, I have a question with the Geneva rootstocks because right now it's all anecdotal. Um, B9, M9, M9 is, but M9 is also susceptible to fire blight. Um, so you have to be mindful about that. Raised beds. With you being a little further south, raised beds might be a really good option. Uh, raised beds will allow for good drainage with the soil. Uh, I do have a grower in Scranton in northeast Pennsylvania who, who has been planting raised beds since the beginning, and he swears by them, and he has encountered any roots freezing as a result. So this may be something everyone needs to be thinking about after a wet year like last year. Reevaluating your, your planting sites. Um, Dr. Rob Crassweller at the Pennsylvania meetings has been telling the growers, what was the silver lining last year to all that rain? Now you know where the wet spots are in your orchard. Uh, so this may be, you may realize, oh, maybe this wasn't a good idea to plant this orchard or this apple block here, this peach block. Uh, make sure your soil is not deficient. And I put uh, Delaware soil testing in the University of Maryland as far as resources for that. Just to talk to your either your extension agent or your, your consultant about doing soil testing. I really recommend this, especially after a year like last year. As far as for 2019 plantings, if you're planting anything this season, and you have had experience at super saturated soil, I really recommend treating the roots first or treating the trees, treating the soil right after you plant them just to give them a leg up because they're going to be vulnerable when they're going in the soil, especially after a year like this. And it's not, not we aren't drying out. It's constantly raining. It's constantly snowing. That wet, that soil is not dried out at all. So you can do root dips, a valiette or rampart, and this is all on the label. This is all in the handout too. You can do a foliar spray after you plant them and leaf out. And you would do this um, on either 30, 60 day interval for prophyte or rampart, two to four week interval. Again, you would be doing this when the disease conditions are there. Uh, so just be mindful of what it's like outside as far as what your interval is. On the soil, you can be applying Ritamil right to the soil, right to the tree rows, but make sure you irrigate it in. Make sure you get that in the soil through some kind of water mechanism. Ritamil Gold SL, just make sure you read the label. There was too much stuff to include on the slide, so just refer to the label if you're using Ritamil SL. And again, raised beds. You may want to start raised beds this year, something to consider, and again, Make sure, as far as checking um, your, your site uh, for nutrient deficiency, and especially with regards to plant analysis, the leaf tissue analysis as well. Uh, for bearing trees, so for trees that are already existing in the soil, there, there's hope for those too. So when conditions are present, this is when you want to start to be treating. Once you see symptoms, as I said before, it's too late. There are options for bearing trees. Aliette is an option. Prophyte and Rampart are an option. You need to shrink your intervals or keep your intervals tight when disease conditions are present. So super, saturate, super saturation weather. Or on the soil, you can do Ritamil drenches. And again, for your bearing trees, just as a reminder, be good to check them this year if you, haven't, if you didn't do it in the fall. Okay, another thing I want to bring your attention is the USDA Tree Assistance Program. This is like a kind of like an insurance program that's funded through the Farm Bill. And so what it is, it's available to growers and to nursery folks. Uh, when you've suffered catastrophic damage that was beyond your control, so a fire blight wipeout, trauma blight, uh, something like the super saturation that you have and you've got a lot of trees dropping like flies this year due to a soil condition. If you are experiencing rapid apple decline, that has recently been recognized. I fought for it and I won, <laughs> so I got this recognized. And so I have a grower in Pennsylvania taking advantage of the TAP program for um, his rapid apple decline issue. What you have to do is contact your farm service agency and you wanna be mindful of deadlines. The 2018 deadline has already passed, but 
if you pay like I think an extra, I can't remember how much, but you have to pay a little bit extra uh, in order to kind of, since the deadline's passed, in order to get compensation for the 2018 season. And there are deadlines for the 2019 season as well. So it's, you have to be doing it for the season at hand. Um, so, and also if you need help for anyone in here is in Pennsylvania, you'd wanna contact me. Um, for in Maryland, contact your state specialist or your extension agent. You can also contact me. I'll be happy to work with the farm service agent, especially if we're right over the state line. Uh, you need typically documentation from an expert that says yes. This was beyond your control, and there was nothing that you could do. And you know, you know. So basically, this was this was beyond what beyond any control measures that you could have put in place. But I want you to be aware of this because I don't think a lot of people are. So even if you have other crops, it it, it says it right here as far as trees, bushes, vines, damage to natural disasters and diseases. It doesn't say diseases, but it, diseases is considered a natural disaster. So, um, and you can just Google the Tree Assistant Program USDA and this will come up. Okay, and we're like right at noon, but I imagine I could take one or two questions if there are any. Yep, any questions for Carrie? Uh, I wanna, um, Carrie, so soil wound diseases, I wonder, uh, you know, have anybody uh, looking at the efficacy of those uh, biologicals like trichoderma? Okay, trichoderma? yeah, so I don't know. Um, yes, all right, let me back up. Yes and no. So trichoderma for southern blight does work, and believe it or not, I isolated trichoderma from some of those apple trees. But obviously the disease overwhelmed it. So there is, like, they're looking at trichoderma, but the results have been real spotty. They've been real inconsistent from what I've read. That, that's what I'm aware of. As far as the other, the other ones, I'm, I'm not as quite sure. Because I'll be honest, is that this is a this is a new area for me, because <laughs> it's just like literally popped up in the last six months, and I haven't had a chance to really come up to speed on the, on the alternatives on the alternative side of things. Mary, when you look at this southern decline in apples, yeah. have you been able to isolate it to some specific rootstocks or some interaction? I know, like in peaches, we can get some interaction in that zone between the rootstock and the, the tree with some viruses and other mm -hmm. things that will take it out. Have you been able to We So we problem? haven't had the trees tested for anything else to, to know if there was something else there making it vulnerable, especially in that one grower site because he had the most loss. So, I mean, that's something that we can look at as far, especially next year. Um, now that I'm because now that I'm aware of it, but that's a real good question. So thanks, that's a good thing to put on my radar because I have no idea if there was another stressor there that made it vulnerable. But that's a good that's a good thought. I've had this problem for quite a while. Southern blight yeah. on your apples. Oh, oh, geez. Okay. And I've had it since 2011. Oh wow. Okay. And I've done everything on your list, but um, yeah, I've done everything. Okay. Between raised beds, I've done trials and different things. Nothing stopped it. Nothing. Man, okay. I was getting 10, 15% of the current. Yeah. Uh, death in my apple tree. Wow, wow. And it was mostly, it was all B9 and okay. N9, 3.7. Okay, seven. okay. Um, those are the only two I had. And then I had some. Um, here's a, here's a, oh, oh yeah, okay. So Geneva? So, was the that only still? way to get rid of it is go to a Geneva 11 or 41. Really? Okay. I had no losses. Okay. Zero. Okay. Zero. So my question then for you is, what was in that site before? Uh, some of it was just grass. Okay. Some of it were pine trees. Oh, okay. <laughs> so one thing I did read was that if an area had been in woods, that seems to be there's a higher incidence, and that commercial grower had been at woods at some point because he was surrounded by woods. I'm surrounded. By woods. And so that's what, and he's kind of like in this weird pocket. And so that, and so I know they had cleared, they'd cleared that land at some point. It, it may have been as like 30 years ago, but it was. So that's, I did read that as far as susceptibility, well, but, I tried everything. wow. Well, well that's, I, I appreciate your comments. Stops, the only thing so Geneva 11, and what was the other 41. one? 41. 41, okay. Both of them were very good. I okay. Uh, All right, okay. I will, I will keep that in mind. Any other questions? Any questions for Okay, uh, Carrie will be here for a while. And uh, so it is time for lunch.
but uh, let me uh, say a few things. 